grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We read just the uh, first verse of our gospel lesson today from Luke chapter 11, verse 14. Now he, Jesus, was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. A few years ago, a young Christian lady asked me the question, do demons still exist? And if they do, do they still possess people? Now, that question is understandable when you look at culture today. Uh, Culture is divided almost in half on the question of the existence of demons and Satan. A little less than half the people, according to the polls I looked at, said, no, we don't think he exists, we don't think demons exist, and therefore people can't be possessed by them. And so depending upon which side of culture one falls down on, that might determine the question, that might determine the answer to the question, do they exist? What also might be uh, confusing in this whole matter is We just don't see a whole lot of people out there today possessed by demons like they were at the time of Christ. And yet there are numerous examples of that in our present day and throughout all the ages. But we do have to admit that it does seem a little bit different today than it does at the time of Christ. The thing to remember here is the Bible never says that Satan and demons will always work in the same way at all places at all times. We do know that at the time of Christ, there were numerous people who were possessed bodily, and many times they were cast out by Christ. And so if there is a difference today between how Satan and demons make themselves known between today and back then. You know, why, why is this different? Why was it so clear back then in so many instances to the eye and all who observed that these people were possessed? And yet today we don't see that, at least quite as often. Why? Well, the important answer here would be that God allowed that activity to take place back then where a lot of people were possessed bodily by demons so that it would be clear to those who saw and to those who wrote it down for us, the apostles, so it would be clear this comparison between demons and Satan on the one hand and Christ on the other. Absolutely clear the difference between those two parties. So let's look at a a number of things that we know about demons based on Scripture. First of all, they are real. They're not myths. They're just as real as you and me and anything else that exists here in creation. In fact, we know that Demons and Satan are creatures. They were created by God. They were created as angels, but they fell like you and I have fallen. But they are very real. And they exist. And they're a lot of them. And Satan, of course, is the chief fallen angel. Number two. These creatures are not anything we want to mess with. 
We are no match for them. They are way beyond us in strength and cunning. So Peter says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Not like a pussycat, but a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We're no match for them. And Adam and Eve found that out the hard way. The third point. Their intention is to deny us from knowing and trusting and loving and experiencing and participating in the will of God. The good and gracious will of God. They don't want that for us. Whether it be here on earth or eternal life. And they especially want to prevent us from participating in that good and gracious will of God when it comes to eternal life in Christ. And the fourth thing to notice about demons and Satan is that they work in several ways. They work by bringing about physical and mental anguish and affliction. You know, that's what we see in our text for today. This mute man. So wherever you find the misery and pain and affliction and death, there you find Satan and demons. They also work by tempting to sin. Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, or Jesus in the wilderness. Of course, Christ won there. But wherever you find a temptation to sin, there you find demons and Satan. And also, somewhat related to this, you find Satan's and de- Satan and demons wherever that which is false is taught. Wherever the word of God is distorted. So wherever you find what contradicts the Bible or the biblical explanation of history or the world or reality or Christ, there you find demons and Satan at work. That's why St. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, The Spirit clearly says that in later times, and we're in the later times now, some will abandon the faith and follow, here it is, deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Well, does that mean we have these little demons on our shoulder whispering into our ears? No, Paul goes on to explain it by saying, such teachings come through hypocritical liars. People who teach falsely. So, they're real, They're powerful. We're no match for them. They don't want us to experience the good and gracious will of God here on earth or in heaven. And they're relentless in the ways that they come at us. So in our text for today, we see that Jesus cast out a demon. And everybody there marveled. Everybody was amazed. But those who did not want to believe in Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior, they saw it, but they came up with a different explanation to explain what they saw. We read that some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. It's very interesting. So everybody saw the same thing. Nobody could deny that a demon was cast out of this man. There were different explanations why it took place. And Jesus points out to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? And so he's saying to them, you people who don't like the true explanation, but you want to come up with this other explanation, it doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. And then in verse 20, he comes up with this very interesting statement. He says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So this one is the correct explanation for what people saw. The kingdom of God has arrived. Now, Scripture teaches us that 
the whole world really is from the time of conception and birth all people are members of the kingdom of Satan and now another kingdom has come the kingdom of Christ the kingdom that is opposed to the kingdom of misery and affliction and sin and death and deception And the the interesting thing here, too, is how Jesus explains this kingdom. He says, by the finger of God. Now, look at it this way. Look at this. God. It's the finger of God. That's all it took. The power of God, but just... What Jesus is saying here is that demons are no match for me in the kingdom of God. No match whatsoever. Christ didn't have to wrestle with demons. He didn't have to engage in hand-to-hand combat. He didn't have to do anything other than flick them away. The finger of God. When Jesus talks about the finger of God, he's talking here about something in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 7 and 8, where, where Moses comes to Pharaoh and wants to deliver the people of Israel. And uh, Pharaoh says, Who are you, Moses? And so what does Moses do? He begins to perform these miracles. Okay? One after another. And Pharaoh says, hey, my magicians can do that. They have supernatural power. And so it's interesting that the magicians, they do imitate the first three miracles that Moses performed. But in at least two out of the three, those miracles are shown to be inferior. But by the time the fourth one comes along, the magicians can't duplicate it. And here's what they say. The magicians tried by their secret art to produce gnats, but they could not. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And so they were saying to Pharaoh, hey, we're way way out of our league here. Way out of our league. You know, we've got our gods that we worship and they give us some powers demons, but this is the God. And so from this point out, they didn't even try. And so again, going back to Christ, all he has to do is say the word. And they're gone. They're cast out. As Luther says in the hymn, Mighty Fortress, one little word will tell him. And this is also the meaning of our verses in our text where Jesus says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe, but when one stronger than he attacks, Christ, attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Well, obviously, Christ is stronger, much stronger. Like that. And then he says this in verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Again, there's only two spiritual kingdoms. Two real spiritual kingdoms. The kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Christ. And all people belong to one or the other. There's no neutrality. Whether you realize it or not, you belong to one kingdom or the other right now. And if you have been baptized and you have true faith in Christ, you belong to the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ in which Satan has no power. The kingdom of Christ. It's not merely a kingdom where you will be delivered from one demon or one ailment Right? Not being able to speak, or a bad shoulder problem, or kidney problem, or heart problem, or cancer. For the kingdom of Christ to be truly meaningful and worth living in, both now and forever, 
There has to be more than deliverance from one demon or one ailment. We need an eternal deliverance from all misery, from all sin, from all deception, and from death. And Jesus would accomplish that. He would accomplish that deliverance. But, he would not accomplish that in this way. By the power of God. The power, little power of God in a flick like that. Instead, Jesus would accomplish this eternal deliverance, you might say, by, by losing. By being defeated. Not by losing to Satan and the demons. They thought so, but that wasn't the case. In weakness and suffering and by death, he would be dealt a loss and be defeated by the justice of God. The passion of Christ. This was it. It was the all-powerful Son of God in human flesh submitting to the justice and wrath of God deserved by sinners. And some people don't like this, thinking that God's Son was physically and eternally punished. God's Son was punished by His own Father. Yeah. It's true. Because on Him was placed the sins of the world. All our sins. And by doing so, the entire work of Satan and demons all their misery, all their deception, all the sin that they promote, all the death that they brought into the world, all of that has been destroyed. In the kingdom of forgiveness, of life and peace and joy has come. And you have entered this kingdom of Christ by means of your baptism and through faith in Christ. That's why Paul said, those of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. And that death of Christ, that passion of Christ, is our deliverance from all sin, from all misery, from all death. We have to put up with it a while here on earth, but it's our deliverance. Now, a couple more things here that are important to remember in our text. Jesus says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person to pass through waterless places, seeking rest and finding them, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than than the first. When we are baptized, Satan and his demons have left our soul. They may be able to afflict us physically, but they have left our soul. But the point here is that Jesus is saying an evil spirit can come back and bring with it even more demons. That is, baptized children of God can abandon the kingdom of Christ and be brought back into the kingdom of Satan. And so if the Christian does not remain occupied by the Holy Spirit, sent by Christ in our baptism, Satan and his demons can re-enter. And so if, when a demon comes back to look at us, and the Holy Spirit is not there, busy and active and encouraging and enabling 
the person to live as a citizen of the kingdom of Christ. And the demon will reoccupy. So, the question is, how does the Holy Spirit remain busy and active so that we remain in the grace of our baptism? Well, that's where we come to the last two verses of our text. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. Now, Jesus kind you might say, mildly rebukes her with what he says next. He's more or less saying to the woman, You know, why are you focusing on my mother Mary? He says this, Blessed rather, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God, and keep it. Hearing the word of God and keeping it. And what does the word tell us to do? <clears throat> the word tells us to repent, not once, but daily. The word tells us to look to and go to Jesus in his word, in the sacrament, in the gospel, in the absolution. The word tells us to show forth this faith we have in Christ by prayer and by loving our neighbor. So this is what the Word tells us to do. Repent, always go to Christ for forgiveness, and then live the life we are to live. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, you are here today. Why? Because you're hearing and keeping the Word of Christ. You are hearing the word of forgiveness. You are being instructed. And what does that mean? It means that the word of Christ, the powerful word of Christ, overcomes everything that Satan throws us. Christ won. You believe in him. And Satan lost. Including in your own life. Amen. To your eyes. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.